back to my series, The Bible Doesn't Make Any Sense. Today's episode, Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. All right, let's see it. This is the story of Jacob wrestling with God. Now, I had to go all the way back to Genesis 25 to get the context on who Jacob was. And even with the context, I still don't understand why this happened. That's just for those people that are going to be like, well, you're reading it out of context. I read the context and I still don't know what the fuck is going on. So Genesis is full of etiologies or origin stories. And that's what this is, an origin story for how we went from a dude named Jacob to a dude named Israel, who is the eponymous ancestor of the land, the people, the nation of Israel. And a lot of what these etiologies are trying to do is tie everything into a single genealogical line, a kind of genealogical taproot of humanity. And we do the same with Esau, who is going to become the eponymous ancestor of the Edomites. And Edom means reddish. It's named after the reddish soil in the area. But in this story, we want Esau to be, one, covered in red hair, and two, to exchange his birthright for a mess of pottage, which in Hebrew is ha'adom ha'adom, a doubling up of a word for red thing. So Esau is basically represented as desperately saying, give me some of that red stuff. And then the verse ends saying, and thus he was called Edom, which means reddish. And so Jacob gets his name changed to Israel. Israel means El contends, but in this story, they understand it to mean fights with God. And so they tell a story of Jacob fighting with God. And it is placed here because this is right before the reconciliation of Jacob and Esau. And it's placed at the Jabbok River because that is the boundary of the land of Israel. So there's a lot of significance to Jacob taking on the name Israel in this place, in this time, and thus becoming the eponymous ancestor of the Israelites. Then the man says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So the man that he was wrestling with was God? Yes, Jacob fights with God and seems to win. And that is necessary because this story is only being told as an etiology for the name Israel. And their folk etymology of that name is that it means fights with God. So they've got to tell a story of Jacob fighting with God. Now, this is going to be uncomfortable for some folks. And so there's another reference to this story elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible that actually has God winning. And that's Hosea 12. In verse 4, at the end, it says, Sarai at Elohim, he fought with God. Now, verse 5, as it stands right now, says, Vayasar el Malak. And he persevered to the angel. And this is nonsensical. And so a lot of scholars assert that the preposition L should be all, which means over and against. He persevered against the angel. But then it has Jacob desperately crying out for a blessing. It represents Jacob as losing. What's going on here? Someone has written in the word malak, where the verse originally began, Vayasar L. Vayasar L, if you take out the space between Vayasar and L, would just be Vayisrael. God persevered, and thus Jacob is desperately crying out. But when you write in Malak, you not only change it so that it means he persevered to the angel and is thus harmonized with Genesis 32, but you also distance God from this, and you change Jacob's wrestling partner from God to an angel. So that editorial change helped reconcile these two passages and also helps move God out of the equation so that Jacob is only wrestling with an angel. Jacob asks him, can you just tell me what your name is? And the man replies, why do you want to know my name? And then he blesses Jacob. And it never says where the man went or what happened to him. This is a story that starts and stops rather abruptly and does not transition smoothly in and out. And some scholars might argue that that is a sign that it has been stitched in secondarily, and other scholars would say this is a rhetorical device that is attention-grabbing. So there's not really a clear answer about that, but abrupt starts and stops to stories were not phenomenally uncommon anciently. What, what is the story? I have so many questions. Why did God feel the need to take the form of a human and wrestle with Jacob? 
this is kind of a standard story in uh, ancient Southwest Asia and in the Bible. Uh, Esther Hamori, in her book, When Gods Were Men, calls this the Ish Theophany and discusses this story in great detail. I would highly recommend that book if you would like an academic discussion of all of this. But in short, that was necessary to serve the rhetorical needs of this etiology. And on top of that, here's one verse that I found that was interesting. The man saw that he could not overpower Jacob. The man, who we later find out is God, could not overpower a human? So the whole purpose is to have Jacob's name changed to Israel, and they decided on a story where God says, You got me. I'm going to change your name to Fights with God. And if this man is supposed to be God, the God that's supposed to be all-knowing, for one, why would he wrestle with Jacob already knowing that he was going to lose? And for two, why would he ask Jacob his name if he already knew it? The notion of God as omniscient, as we understand that concept, did not exist in this time period. That would be a much later philosophical innovation. And another question. You see how it says your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you struggle with God and with humans and have overcome? They never call him Israel. I went on and read the other chapters. They, they keep calling him Jacob. So this etiology for the naming of Jacob is a cue to an audience from much, much later down the road who just needs to see, ah, that's where it happens. Even though the bringing together of all these traditions includes a number of stories afterwards that are still about a dude named Jacob. So it is just being placed in this position for an audience much, much later down the road. And on top of everything else, the biggest question of all is, how is it that Jacob, a mere human, saw the face of God and didn't die? Nothing happened to him. I, I don't understand. Exodus chapter 33 verse 20 says, You cannot see God's face, for no one may see me and live. And 1 John 4 and 12 says, No one has ever seen God. So there were different approaches to the visibility of God anciently, and we have different literary layers that have different perspectives on this in the Hebrew Bible. So for instance, in Genesis 18, Abraham is walking and talking with God, and there's no problem at all. There's no reference to the notion that Abraham's life was threatened. We have another literary layer where there is a threat, but there are multiple exceptions to that threat. And we have stories where people see God's face and either express fear or shock that they have survived seeing God's face. So Hagar, we have Gideon, we have Manoach and his wife, we have Moses in Exodus 3. We have a number of examples of this. Still, another literary layer has Moses as the only exception. With any other prophet, I will speak through visions and dreams, but with Moses, I speak face to face as a man talks with his neighbor. In still another literary tradition, not even Moses gets to be the exception, and that's what we have in Exodus thirty-three twenty, where God says, you cannot see my face, because no human can see me and live. And then we get into Greco-Roman period Judaism, and Greek philosophy begins to influence their conceptualization of deity, and we move towards God's hiddenness. And by the time we get to the Gospel of John in the New Testament, John can assert no one has ever seen God. And this is just a change in the conceptualization of God. And when you bring this later idea together with the earlier ideas, there's a contradiction. And I discuss this in much more detail in my video number McClellan 1784. So did Jacob lie about seeing God face to face? And if he did lie, why is this story in the Bible if it's not true? And if he wasn't lying, he did see God face to face, then those other verses saying that no one has seen God and no one can see God, those are wrong. And this is one of the reasons that we have no choice but to negotiate with the text if we want it to be authoritative. Those who think of it as inspired are going to think of it as univocal, which means they have to make these differences go away, which requires picking the idea that we want to take priority and then requires either ignoring, uh, removing entirely, or reinterpreting all those other verses that disagree with the text you have picked as the one that you want to take priority. So that's part of the negotiation process that must go on if you want this text to be univocal, to be inspired, to be an errant, which are all dogmas that are not supported by any data and are only there because people have decided to impose them.